Always a good time when something new comes in the mail. Here we go. Ooh, ooh, it was squished. I think we'll be all right, though. Let's have a look, see at what we got here. Not bad. Oh, thumbs up. What's this? Are these little notepads or something? Okay. All right. That's good. What we got here? All right. So these are going to be <laughs> revision zero of the video display board for the Z80 Retro. There we have it. I love it when we get a new PC board. It's always a fun time. Of course, who knows what's wrong with it yet, right? <laughs> well, let's fire it up and see what happens. In the first draft of this build here, I'm going to put parts in this board. What I'm really going to do is I'm going to just kind of dismantle the test breadboard and... Whatever parts I can recycle off of here and put into here is what I'm going to do. All right. And then I'll uh, have to put a 40 pin and then we'll be able to plug it right onto the uh, retro board. Now, to get started, these through pole capacitors for the bypass caps in here are kind of expensive. Relatively speaking, I'm going to use these little surface mount jobbies that'll just barely kind of fit over the through holes, parts like this. I don't know how well that's shown. You can see that on there. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and put these on here first because it'll be hard to get the iron in there next to the uh, sockets and stuff like that if I do them later. All right. Um, I can also start to see mistakes that, <laughs> before I even put it together. I forgot to put bypass caps for these two trip, uh, these two chips here. It'll probably go okay without it, but that's obviously a, a, a you know a mistake on my part. So I'm going to have to deal with that. So I'm going to assume that this is not going to be the final draft. It might work, but I'm not going to waste the expensive parts or parts that I have that are that I don't have a lot in stock. Here is the uh, um, right angle RCA jack, and you can see it fits in the hole. I had to create a custom footprint for this so i just want to make sure that it's okay now i only have like one or two of these in my shop and i don't want to waste them when i know this is not going to be the final draft this probably won't work there'll be something wrong with this so let's figure it out as we go now i have like a hundred of these and it just so happens that this will kind of i can ram it in the same footprint there so this actually will probably be okay so i'm going to go ahead and put that in there and hopefully these massive wide wings don't short anything out. These pins are grounded and there's no traces nearby, so I guess that's okay. We'll find out. <laughs> um, and uh, all right, so we'll go from there. Uh, what else is weird about this? There's a lot of parts I don't need. I don't need to worry about the joysticks. And remember these resistors in stuff over here, most of which are optional, actually, because it depended on how I want to configure this emitter follower to deal with the video output. And we already know that while it doesn't go to spec, the video can just, I can just take the video right off the chip and, and, and take it directly if I really want to. So uh, we'll go ahead and play around with this uh, emitter follower and maybe... Uh, Try a couple of different resistor sizes to see what happens to the video. Um, to see if we can improve the color. It didn't quite look right to me when we were messing around with it. So we'll see uh, what happens there. Now, the packages that I laid out here for these resistors, I kind of made a boo-boo. I used the same ones. Let me see. I pull it wires off the retro here. I use the same uh, footprints I have on the retro. and. These resistors here are really super tiny ones. I don't have a lot of these. I don't have a lot of resistors of this uh, footprint in stock. A lot of different sizes, I mean. I've got plenty of these sizes, but I don't have 10 and 470s and all these other ones. I have tons of these in the quarter watt uh, size 
that are bigger. And obviously there's a little bit of room on this board here. I really wish I would have used the longer footprints so I can use the cheaper uh, parts that I already have lying around here. Uh, whoopsie on my part there as well. Now, here is a quarter watt resistor. You can clearly see it won't fit uh, between those holes. It's way bigger than it, 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 <laughs> it will be, uh, that, that will tolerate. However, I can bend it around like this and put them in like that. Again, since I know that this board is not going to be my final draft. And that is what I will do, okay, for these uh, parts here. Plus, it'll be easier to get a pliers in here and pull them out if I decide I don't like the part sizes that I've chosen. And it's probably okay. Easier to remove, all right? So, first things. We'll um, put down these uh, little surface mount jobbies. And then uh, we'll see, we'll, we'll put the decoder and the, test the power and all that fun stuff out before we waste too many parts on this thing. All right, I've got the decoder, VDP, and now I've got the DRAMs. Didn't have the DRAMs on my other test circuit. I'm going to just tap off the uh, output video signal and put a little wire in there. Should I do that? I don't know. The problem with that is if I put solder in that hole, it'll be, it might be hard to clean it out. Although I do have a solder sucker, I could clean it out with that. Um, point is it might be hard to get the transistor in there after i've been clowning around of course i could just poke a wire in there and not even solder it in and it probably hold that's what i'll do i mean i don't want to waste hardly any parts in here unless i have to one of the problems is definitely going to be the crystal and the crystal i can actually solder it in and let it stick way up like this and then reseed it later i'll do that right now whole thing to hold steady this will make it easy to take this the, the, the crystal back out again and recycle it because i only have two of these oops dang it the whole thing just slid ah stupid <laughs> i don't even want it in that way if i wanted it all the way soldered in all right okay there we go And the other thing that I don't have a lot of are the load capacitors. Just tip it over sideways a little bit like that. So um, I could try it with no load capacitors at all. Or I could solder the load capacitors and sticking way up just like I did this crystal. I think I'm going to do that. These are the load, this is the load capacitor that I uh, just recycled off the... Um, the breadboard that I did in my earlier video. As you can see, these don't want to fit in those in the in the footprints there, because the uh, way the pins are set up. So if you have this happening to you, don't mess with them by hand because you might wreck the part. You could crack the case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab it with my uh, uh, pliers and very carefully straighten these babies out without putting pressure on the edges of the capacitor the epoxy, the glue that makes up the case there, all right? So, I mean, it looks like maybe what I really should do is straighten it out sideways like that first. I can see that thing. I don't know. You can see what I just did to it there. And then I'm going to grab it and take that whole thing, and then I'm going to twist it around that way, okay? Do that on the other one as well. That's okay-ish, right? Now, this should actually seat all the way down in the footprint if I wanted it to. 
if I do that, it might be very difficult to take it back out. So I'm like, like the uh, crystal here, I'm going to solder it in and stick it way up. Because I know this board is not the final one because these don't even have bypass caps. So it's probably going to need some help. It'll be ugly, but it's made to be recycled, right? And I don't want to. I I don't want to mess these up because I don't have. I just don't have a lot of these in stock. And I don't want to wait and then pay ten dollars shipping for a one penny capacitor. That is not making me happy. <laughs> these are going to get recycled. All right, so these are all in. That's all in. Not bad. Uh, put the 40 pin on there, and we should be able to see some video coming off the center pin there. You can actually see the trace in here coming out of the chip, so you can see it coming over like that. This is obviously the base of the transistor where the video signal goes. As it goes to this emitter follower, that's going to be the emitter. And this here is going to be the trace that comes over here to this 470 ohm resistor to ground. That's your 470 load. Why do I got a 10K? Oh, this is the 10K that... Uh, why did I put a 10K in there? Steve Ciarcia put one in there in his. This is I'm not going to populate that 10K. The 33 and the 330 are my voltage divider on the output of the emitter follower okay so we probably need those if we want to see any video at all i don't know if i care so much about c9 i don't really care about c7 we've already seen on the scope what that looks like it's just a little humming noise that we might see in there of course these uh drams may have a fit <laughs> if we don't have enough bulk capacitance nearby, I don't know. We'll find out. We'll all learn something here today. All right, let's get a 40 pin on there. Now I'm going to put a fancy 40 pin on here that has wire wraps pins sticking through so that I can uh, clip probe leads on here. I've learned my lesson on that in the past. Now, I got a whole bunch of these. I'm not sure where they came from. Uh, this extender on here suggests, I mean, these, I think Adafruit sells some that are like this, but I would have not ever bought a whole box of them. I wonder if these came from somebody on like Amazon or something that sold them. I don't really know. Now, they don't seem to have a key or a notch or an indication of pin one. They're very symmetric. Usually there's a little arrow or something somewhere. Wow. Okay. Guess it's not going to really matter then. Now, there's sort of a trick to these things. Um, because, you know, you need to solder it in from this side. Uh, and the pins all stick way out like that. You end up in a situation where... You're going to end up getting solder running up these pins, which is not going to be desirable, okay? That's not going to be a happy time. And now, with these giant pins there and this socket here and the big plastic thing here, it may be difficult to solder in these parts here. The pins are going to stick out there and there. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and risk it. Uh, I would recommend, if we knew that this was going to work, I would put those parts in now. But I don't want to waste them, even though this diode is a no-brainer. Uh, these little headers, they add up. And I'm kind of bummed out. i got to waste this special uh, wire wrap long pin, 40-pin header. And this is going to be next to impossible to recycle. So this is, you know... This is going to be wasted if the board doesn't work. Kind of unfortunate. Now, again, I'm going to do kitty corners. Get started. And these might take a little more heat because there's a lot more. There's a lot of metal involved in the connector there. And I'm going to have to take a like, nice close look to make sure that's in there right. They got a nice solder cone on there. 
I also want to make sure that the connector is not sticking up in the air. I don't have a good focus. There you go. You can sort of see here. If I get the light right. I, um, yeah, that's seated down there on the board. Okay. Where you see the pins is in this like extender connector thing. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do the kitty corner to that one. Because if you don't do this, what happens is it could get a little, I like guess, boy, this is hard to see. Uh, you could end up in a situation where it like gets crooked like this and you don't notice. And even this outrageous example, I've been there and done that. So you want to do one pin in each corner so that you can reheat it and reseat the thing if it is not perfect. And with a connector like this, sometimes you need a little extra heat on there, a little extra time before the heat goes in there. So that's on there. It's not crooked. It's it's seated up against the circuit board, okay? And I can't really do this. And the focus is all on a whack. Due to the depth of field on this lens, I'm sorry. All right, and then we got to go around and do all these pins because just about every single one is used for all the uh, data lines and some of the address lines. And uh, otherwise, you could probably skip some of them. But if you skip too many of them, what happens is there's not going to be enough pins that are soldered in to hold the connector on the board. And I've had the connector actually pull clean off the board with all the pins torn out of it if I don't solder in enough of them to overcome all the friction of each individual pin when you plug the two connectors, right? So generally speaking, unless you're really sure you want to try and recycle the thing, and you're going to be careful if you ever unplug it, you pretty much want to solder in all these pins, okay? Same thing happens on those IDC ribbon connectors. Sometimes the uh, pins get torn out of those things. Come on. See, this was not hot enough. This may be a power pin, right? If the pin has ground on it, and there's a lot of copper uh, on that annular ring, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the right thermal relief. You're going to have to sit here for like 20, 30 seconds getting enough heat in there. And it's just amazing the difference, you know. That's why you need to make sure you got your thermal reliefs right, assuming you want them, right? And I just melted the corner of that socket, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that on there, but I can smell it. <laughs> Whoopsie. Probably should have done this big connector first because it's hard to get the iron in there now, right? And uh, it would even be worse if I had J6 already installed. I basically couldn't even do it, probably. Yeah, so mental note, if you're following along at home, do the big 40-pin Javi first. Or even better yet, see if mine works before you bother because... If this doesn't work, you don't want to waste your time and money on it. Let me waste my time and money on it. Let someone else screw it up, All right? Okay, I think I got enough parts in here that uh, it would wake up. I even have more because we can put in the DRAM. I mean, we should be able to get video out of this sucker. All right, so here's a retro. Oh, it should be able to just plug this sucker right in there. Now, remember, there's no alignment, uh, you know, housings or anything on here. So when you, if you're going to plug this thing in, you need to eyeball that sucker and make real sure that these pins all line up right and you're not off a row or something like that, okay? Now, this board is supposed to line up with the outside edge of the retro board. And if you're off a tenth of an inch, it should be relatively obvious, okay? Now, I don't have any kind of a thing isolating this board from the retro board, and it's going to just slap down on top of it. It's not necessarily the worst thing. 
Now I actually have 3D printed some standoffs. The same kind of thing I put on my uh, EEPROM programmer. And I could put a screw in here and put that on there. And I think I'm going to do that. Although this one's the wrong size for this board. How about one of these? Here's another sized one. So what I should do is go over here and measure it. Yeah. So these are too long. Here's another one. Now, if you do this sort of thing, you can always just take a wire cutters and chop that sucker off. I got a couple of different sizes. Uh, no, they're all too big. So what I'm going to do, this one's actually printed a little bit flawed, too. This end is messed up. I'm going to just cut that end off with my side cutters here. That looks good to me. It looks a little short, actually. I'm going to just guess. And you know what? It won't matter. Because over here, it doesn't matter if it's off a millimeter, okay? What I want to do is just make sure that the metal parts inside there don't come down and hit these uh, oscillator cans or anything like that. That's all. So, uh, this should hold like one of those M2.5 bolts. I got a whole box of these things here. Let's see here. Alrighty, M2.5 by whatever, and we don't need a particularly big one. Uh, these look a little short. I'm going to grab something like this. All right, this is an M2.5 by 6. I'm going to put it in the hole like that and get a little Allen wrench. And now what I'm going to do, now this thing is just a 3D printed square with a, a cylinder, cylindrical hole in the middle. And this is going to matter a lot based on your filament uh, or your extruder diameter hole and stuff like that, even the speed you print. What you, what I do is I just try to different couple of different sizes and vary them by about a tenth of a millimeter and uh, found that for my printer and the nozzle and all that, what the right size really is. And, uh, you know, I it, the and, and that will make a big difference, as would even the uh, the uh, print material and stuff like that. So you're going to have to experiment a little bit on your own to find out what, what works for you. And then grab yourself a little Allen wrench and screw that sucker in there. Now I'm going to put some downward pressure on this to make it thread itself into this standoff here. Okay. Sucker out of the way. And if you have to, you can use this to get some more leverage. But you shouldn't really do not over tighten it because all it'll do is just tear the 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 screw threads will just tear up the plastic in there because the plastic's never gonna hold up. You can't don't 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 torque that sucker down. You're not putting a wheel on a car, all right? Yeah, no impact wrench. <laughs> okay, so this should boot up. It certainly should boot up with no chips in it. This shouldn't have any impact on the retro if we power it up like this. Okay, make sure the connectors are all good. Um, wouldn't be the worst thing to do to do a power-up test with it like this, but I don't think it's going to be worth it. I, it, I think it's going to be okay. The only thing that'll be wrong with this board at this stage would be if I did something like just, you know, drew the schematic wrong and have the wrong address lines or something on the decoder here, right? So what I'm going to do is pull the chips out of the breadboard over here, okay? Now this is, what is this thing? A 1979 LS138. Now I know, you know, when I showed you some scope traces about the address decoder, this was the chip that was in use. This might actually not be a very good chip, because if you look at these old, uh, the scope trace in the prior videos, when I was looking at the timing information, this doesn't pull it, the output uh, up in a nice square shape very well. So this actually is, this chip is kind of, might have been a little beat up. I could probably get a new one. I don't know if I have any more of those on hand, though. Uh, okay, so now 
I want to pull this thing out of the board here. All right, don't do one of these, grab it by hand. It never, ever works. It's 100%. You're going to end up pulling up one end and mess up the pins. I'm sure I've mentioned this on my channel before. You don't ever remove a chip from any socket ever without prying it. And I don't care what kind of tool you use. You don't take your hand and you just yank that sucker out. You will screw it up. It's a certainty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pry up one end, and I'm going to go around, and I'm going to pry up the other end, okay, until the thing basically falls out on its own. Then you remove the chip. Never, ever just grab it and pull it. You will bring it up like this. You will bend all the pins. You will then go in the pliers. You will go to straighten them back out, and maybe once you'll be able to straighten them back out. But if you ever do it ever again, or you do it on a full 90 degree, they, they'll just, you're, you're done. It snaps off. It's not worth it. It's, a, it's certain to fail. You're never going to get them to come out by yanking these suckers out by hand. All right? Now I'm going to have to finagle it around to make sure these pins align with those holes. Kind of put it in there. Because remember when you buy a chip, if it's a brand new chip, and this one's already been messed with a little because I put it in the uh, the breadboard, but these pins tend to be on an angle. They don't just come out and go straight in, okay? Here's a brand new chip over here, never been used, and these pins are going to be a little bit more, uh, oops, wanting to be a little bit wider than the pins on the socket. Actually, this one looks like it's been bent a little bit as well maybe this one's just been dropped or something but when you first buy them the pins tend to stick apart a little bit and uh anyway my point is they're hard to get into a socket so quite often what i'll do is i'll put in one row of pins like this and uh, oops i'll put in one row of pins like that and i'll shove really hard and bend them inwards and then i'll do these other ones on the other side of a socket and bend those in by pressing it in this direction. You know, you gotta judge based on the number of pins here, how hard you're gonna do all that. It's a technique, right? So in order to get the pins to go in the holes of the socket, otherwise the, the pins are just, you know, sticking way out like that. So anyway, so be careful when you do that. Now this particular 40 pin socket is a cheap one that I had lying around. Ah! <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should use this one. Doesn't really want to go in there, does it? <laughs> Dang it. I'm going to take it off the retro because I may have to crank this sucker down like this and I need to get access to the bottom. Of it. There we go. No, oh, it just slapped in there. Now, when you do that and you got to finagle it around, I'm going to look at it on an angle down from the end here and look down inside there because, uh, you can get a single pin that gets hung up on something in there. And then the pin can come out of the chip, go down, and then kind of accordion like this inside there. And I've had that happen, right? So you want to look pretty closely uh, to see if that, that doesn't really happen to you. I'm pretty confident that it hasn't happened. Uh, when it does, usually what you'll see is it will kind of stick out a little bit on, on one side. You should see a little bump on the side as it before it goes in underneath itself. So the fact that every one of these pins is all lined up and nothing's bulging anywhere means I probably did not screw it up. Okay. Pin one is up there. Pin one is up there. All the other parts are in. Um, like I said, I can just take a piece of wire like this and just stick it in this middle hole right there. That's where the base of that transistor is and this trace you can see right here going into the video coming out of that chip i think i'm gonna just for now uh i'm gonna just let it sit in there like this it'll make enough physical electrical contact you don't want it to stick way out inside here by the way because it's going to stick out and short on something in here if you're a total slob uh so uh, be careful if you're going to play these games. All right. And I'll get really noisy video. I might have to wiggle around the wire a little bit. But let's just, I'm going to do that just for now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run the same program I ran before. 
try and tell this to make a green screen. And I want to see the green screen before I risk wasting any more parts in here, okay? So I'm going to just power it up like this. All the same software. Everything's been on here. Nothing's been touched. It's never even been used since the last time I recorded any uh, videos uh, when we were playing around with the, uh, with the uh, breadboard, okay? I'm going to just kind of tuck it in like that. Yeah, that's what you want, right? On the high-frequency chattering of the crystal. Great idea, John. <laughs> Nitwit. <laughs> So here's the connector that goes back to my video capture. I'm going to just get some gator clips and grab the ground and the signal, and I'm going to hook it up to um, uh, this wire like that, okay? Boy, you know, I could also just put this thing in here, and then I could just connect this wire up to this pin right there, you know, manually. Or I can actually poke the wire onto whatever one of these uh, holes over here goes directly to this pin. We're going to have to check the schematic which one of these resistors goes to this signal. It turns out it's not going to be impossible at all to see because we know that, that signal is this one that runs around the back of the board. Uh, uh, it runs on the front. Yeah, it is. It, it runs over to here is where it is. And it goes through um, that beer right there. So it's between that hole and this one, and there's not much on the board, so we should be able to find it. It pops up right there. It goes right over to here. So that is the one, that is the, uh, that hole right there on the left edge of that 330 ohm resistor. And that makes perfect sense because it's part of the divider between the 3030 and the 33 ohm. There should be a, a, a a trace between these two, if that's the case, I believe. Let's double check the schematic and the PC board layout to confirm that. This might actually be connected on the back. Hmm. You can see that this one has the, um, the, uh, um, the thermals to go to ground on that pin or that via there, I think. Uh, we better take a closer look at the uh, KiCad stuff. All right, so this is by no means optimal, really, right? But ComVid is the output uh, that comes off the, uh, the VDP. There's the base of the transistor. Now it comes over here to either be terminated at 470 ohms, uh, and here's the 10K uh, feedback resistor that I'm not going to use. And it also then what? The output that would be the emitter there would go to this resistor here, part of the feedback we're not going to use, as well as there's the divider there. So if I just take either one of these two um, holes and connect it up and over to this hole here, that would take the output of the VDP and go directly into the RCA jack. No terminators, no nothing. And we know the video looks recognizable if we do that. And I can just take a piece of wire and stick it in the holes. I don't even need to solder it to make that happen. I can throw the connector in here, and then we don't have to worry about gator clips and all that other stuff, okay? Then I can pull that loose wire out, and we can populate the rest of this if the thing comes online and works. My first goal right now is to make sure the chip works, and we can write and read from it that I didn't screw up the schematic or the board in some way that prevents the chip from being able to be interacted with. Like, oops, I put the write and the read on the wrong pins or something just foolish like that. Or <laughs> I put M1 should have been there. I mean, these are the kind of mistakes you make. You know, you try and focus on everything um, and you end up making a dumb mistake like, you know, that, all right? Or you mislabel it over here. Anything could go wrong. Let's just sanity check this thing. Uh, before we get too far, I'm pretty confident that the power is okay and things like that. But you know, I've made that mistake too. <laughs> and by that, I mean sometimes I actually have the power connected totally opposite the VCC going to ground. That happens, right? It, it just does, you know. Whoops. And of course, I've never used these before, I've never designed with DRAMs before, I've never used a DRAM, uh, not of this kind ever. 
So who knows what I could have screwed up with these things, all right? At least VCC and VDD are labeled and so on. Uh, I actually think I had to create these parts because they weren't in the KiCad library. So I could have the wrong pins, right? Anything could go awry at this point. Let's try it out. I guess I got to put the connector on first, right? Oops. Here we go. Seat in there. Hopefully it doesn't short anything out. Now these pins out here, this one here and that one there are ground. This one's ground here. So And so is the whole circuit board around this. So I got lucky and I didn't, for example, this, 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 this track here doesn't go too close to this metal or anything like that. That would have been a problem. And that capacitor there, good thing I didn't put a through hole capacitor on there. Uh, with this connector, it would hit the housing there, right? Not that it would be the worst thing. It might still fit under there, but you know, this is not obviously the one that's supposed to be there. It's supposed to have this thing, which uh, stays out of the way. Okay. But I'm going to do this because I got a whole bunch, like I said earlier, in stock, literally like 50 of these. And I've got two of these. So I don't want to waste the two that I have in need, as it looks like there'll be another rev of this board anyway. Go ahead and waste the ones I don't care about. Now, these are some pretty big holes and there's a lot of space in there. So I'm gonna get a bigger gauge solder here. Cause I would use, you know, 10 feet of that other stuff before I even have a a decent solder joint otherwise. All these things nicely soldered in there. Okay. It looks pretty good. Now I'm going to clip off some of the excess. Is these are so long. I don't, I mean, I don't think it's going to hit anything in here, but, and no, <laughs> I'm going to trim this. No, I'm not going to let the metal fly all over the room because I don't know where it's going to land. So catch it. And when you cut it and then throw it in your garbage. Or so cut your finger when you're doing this either. That would be dumb. Not that it uh, would be easy to do. Just be careful, right? Okay, so that's pretty good. Now we're going to go from, well, we know that the, um, we just looked at the board. So we know that the, the that com vid goes to the base of this transistor and then it comes over here. It connects to these two um, through holes, and it connects up here to these two, I believe. The 10K. Yeah, it goes to the 10K and the 470. It doesn't go to the 10 ohm. It goes to these two holes and these ones. So all I really need to do is jump for the 10K to the 33 there. And uh, we should have video then coming out of this here. And when that's the case, we can plug this. We can see it on my capture. So if I plug all this in, again, I can't stress enough. When you're cutting corners. Make sure that the darn pins align on there. Okay, that looks good. Now, when you got these hanging around here, these metal things can short out and cause problems. So get them out of the freaking way, all right? Okay, now we get a nice uh, USB charger here to power it up. And then plug it in. We got everything all connected here. Try to uh, pass the smoke test on this sucker. Would be nice, right? All right, so the most handy piece of wire I have lying here is this one. We can connect. 
some bid to the RCA Jack by just putting this in here and kind of giving a little bit of pressure on there. Uh, I don't want to just shove the thing way down in the hole. I'm going to bend it a little bit. Again, I don't know what I'm going to run into if I push it in there too far. You know, come down on top of the uh, flash chip or something. Right? Don't be too sloppy here. No, uh, you don't want to put anything metal on here, so I'm going to put the plastic handle of my wire cutters on there just to give it some pressure to hold it down. That feels pretty good. So if I fire this up, well, let's give it a smoke test first, right? <laughs> let's pass the smoke test, and then we'll go from there. So... Good sign. These LEDs came on and did the usual song and dance during the reset here, okay? You see that goes on. It's reading the SD card, and it booted up. So uh, this is not heating up. Usually you don't want to actually do what I just did, but I'm pretty confident that this is okay. And by that, I mean this thing could heat up to like a gazillion degrees before you know it. And uh, DRAMs are known to have done that back in the day. So generally, you don't want to get a lot of finger contact. If you're going to do it with your finger, what you really want to do is come in from an angle and just touch a little bit at once, not just the whole wide, okay? All right, so... So first things first, let's see if we have it uh, talking to us. Yes, it did boot up and it is running. This is awesome. Now let's bring in, uh, well, I can just run this thing. We did this once before. Terminal out of the way. Bring this on. That's not a good sign, except I did not yet plug in the capture device. So let's close that, plug it in, and try it again. And in this case, it came online, and it's black. And I believe that's what it did last time until we tried to set it to some other value. So remember we did DDT. Now, as you recall, what we wanted to do was load the accumulator with CC or some color code. Again, these are the 8080 mnemonics because I don't have a Z80 based debugger on my card here. Oops, not out I, just out 81, right? MBI, oops, A comma 87. And we want to out that on 81. And then we want to say jump back to 100 to make this into a loop. Disassemble. Load A with CC. I believe that was the dark green color. Put that out. Then say 87 to store it in register 7. And then we're good. And remember, we say XP to look at the program counter. That's good. We say T to trace one instruction. So let's go ahead and bring the camera up here. Make this thing super dramatic. Ooh. Trace it. Oops. Can't see what I'm doing. Okay, there we go. So that sends the value, trace, loads the register. This should now write out the, oh, thank you. We have green, ladies and gentlemen. And you know what else we have? We have an insane amount of noise right now in that video. This is so bad, it's worse than I remember seeing it coming out of the breadboard. Now, remember, I don't have any of the filter caps in there. I don't have the emitter follower in there. Um. So that's not too shocking. This is the warbly looking video image. Let's have a look, see at what we got right now on the scope and confirm all that. Yeah, okay. So the RCA jack will make a reasonable ground. Let me just clip the probe right on there. Okay, I'm going to take the ground off the other one. This is like not optimal grounding, but it's fine. It's good enough for this test. Set up my scope. Now we know that this pin here is video. 
So we know that the very low sink tip voltage to the black voltage in the color burst is supposed to be about 0.3 volts. And that looks like that's what we've got here. If we move the cursors up to the uh, measure that is between black and the peak of the brightness, we don't get the full 0.7 volts, but that's fine because it doesn't need to be uh, full on bright. This is dark uh, green, so that's not too shocking. And you can see an awful lot of noise on there. It's not a beautiful thing, but it's not necessarily wrong either. Now, if we zoom back a little bit, we can sort of see a kind of a wavy bit of noise in the signal that we saw before, before I put in the 470 microfarad capacitor. All right, so I shut the power off. What I'm gonna do is plug in 470 uh, microfarad, the big boy over there. And uh, take another reading. I'm pretty confident that the uh, this is going to take care of that. It did last time, so I'm going to do it again, right? Now you can see, if you look closely, there's a little teeny plus over there, and then this giant white mark, okay? The white mark there matches the big arrow uh, for the negative side on the capacitor there. Now, if you're not entirely convinced, Look closely and you can see that this pin here has a uh, thermal release to the ground plane on the board. It's probably on both sides like that. Okay. So make sure that you get it in the right way. Otherwise it will blow up in your face. And yes, it will. That's what this little triple uh, dent is right there. It is a vent on the bottom and the top. So this rubber thing could blow out, but once we solder it in the board, it may be held in there too tightly. So if it overheats and starts boiling, it's um, the electrolyte that's in there or whatever you call that stuff. It's got a liquid uh, soaked bunch of like paper essentially in there. And the liquid will boil and it's gotta go somewhere. <laughs> if you get a phase conversion, you got about a 16,000 to one increase in volume in very little time. And it always seems to go in your face. Now, somebody gave me guff for not doing one thing at a time in one of my other recordings. I was up making upgrades like this. Sometimes it's due to editing. I might say something dumb in a video. I don't want to hear that. We don't want that, and I have to sacrifice, you know, for the quality, you know, to make it family safe. <laughs> anyway, I can end up in an incoherent video, and I'm sorry when that happens. We had to cut it for time. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, so I added the capacitor. We can plug this back in. Now we need the video plugged in the way we had it before because this right now is providing the termination on the ComVid output line here at 75 ohms, which is, as you saw the spec earlier when we looked it up, the previous time we were playing around with this design, uh, that's too low. It's not supposed to be that way, but um, you know, that's the kind of guy I am. I'm living on the edge. The final version will put in the uh, emitter follower and all that. I'm just doing this because we did it before. And nothing blew up. And what I want to do now is bring it back online, put the program back in, run it again, get the green, and uh, probe it again right there. Kind of a before and after shot. Ooh, that green looks nice this time. And I I think it looks better on the scope. It definitely looks better on the screen. So, yes, we are better off overall. All right, let's go ahead and dismantle this and put in the output driver so I don't have that hokey wires and stuff in there. 
Then we'll try and figure out if the DRAM is going to work okay. Now it might actually be, you know, it might actually be okay to just stick the DRAM in there and let the garbage be. Uh, it might very well be that it the screen will just fill up with random junk, which is basically what we need right now. That would be very uh, fortunate and lucky. So, uh, well, yeah, we got two things we need to do here. DRAM and these uh, output. You know what? I'm going to do the DRAM first. We're going to go ahead and put the little jumper back on there, this little guy, and we're going to just put the DRAMs in and power it back up. I don't know, 87, 31. Maybe that's 31st week in 1987, I guess. I don't know. Okay, double check. We have the power in my hand. I'm not plugging this into a live circuit, which would suck. All right, put these bad boys in there. Come on. This is what I was talking about earlier. I'm going to bend the pins to get them to seat right. This is how I do it. Kind of push them a little bit. Try and because you can see them kind of splayed out. Now, if you can't do it that way, what you can do is kind of do it this way. Now, don't push down on these pins like this. Then you'll screw the thing up. What you need to do is push down on the package like that. All right? More so than on the pins. You can see I got that one a little bit. This is just one of those finesse things that takes practice. And you got to kind of know uh, how much to do it. All right? Okay, so this will go in there, hopefully. It's still too wide. Right, so a little bit of sideways pressure in there to get the pins in, and then we're in. There you go. Uh, put the ground back on there. Snip all that off. Okay, and uh, we get another one. Pin one up. Uh, maybe I should have done the one on the left first. This actually looks like it's a little bit crooked. <laughs> like I bent the pins uh, inconsistently, perhaps. But that's okay, as long as they make contact. It doesn't really matter. Do the same thing with this one. Okay. Now this is actually kind of tough to do on this silicone pad because I'm used to. Oop! See now I did a little bit much. There's a little now it's a bit pigeon toed. But you know what? I think it's still going to go in without a real big problem. Yeah, it's fitting there. If you do it too much, you're going to have to get a pliers and straighten it back out again or something like that. Okay. Pin one orientation looks good. Okay, not bad, yes. All right. Any last requests? <laughs> okay, go ahead and put our little jumper back in there again. A little bit of weight on there to keep it a good electrical contact. What am I forgetting? I don't know. Well, let's power it up, see what happens now. That's a bad sign. The LEDs did not light up. So what else changed? This is in okay. This could actually, in theory, be shorting something out, but the fact that these LEDs did not come on uh, makes me think we have a direct short somewhere. That's not a good thing. Hmm. Could I have shorted something out with this? I don't think it reaches through enough to do anything. Boy, I wonder if I screwed up the DRAM part of the schematic. Oh, wouldn't that suck? Let's just cross our fingers and hope the cable wasn't in right.